Hi everyone. The YouTube and Google Plus user that goes by the name of GeoAngle, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, and I will refer to in this video as George, because I'm a dock dropper, has made an interesting observation in the comments section of one of my recent videos. And I thought it was something interesting. It's a, it's a topic that I've actually been wanting to talk about, and he made a great observation there. The video was one in which I was elaborating on my history, my background, mostly growing up, on how I didn't come from a privileged background. I grew up quite poor. Uh, we had no electricity, no running water in the house. We had an outhouse. We had a root cellar for a number of years. And then finally, we got the uh, technological advancement of a propane fridge, etc., etc. And the fact that I was the ridiculed and bullied kid in school. I wasn't just one of, I was the kid that everyone picked on. And I think it was mostly because I was sort of labeled as different when I entered school because I wasn't able to be as clean and tidy as some of the other kids and I didn't come in right at the kindergarten level as most of them did that grew up in that area. We moved to that area. I came in uh, in grade two, I think it was, partway through grade two and that's, that's always a, danger, uh, a dangerous way to enter school when you're coming from outside. He was talking about straw men and I think it's interesting, of course we're all familiar with the, the standard straw man uh, definition, you know, that someone takes your argument and and sort of feeds it out there as though it's a facsimile, you know, th there are some portions of it that are similar, but it's different enough that it actually now contains uh, fallacious argumentation. So it's something that they can tear down. It's something that may look a little bit like your argument, but it's not your argument, and it's specifically constructed so that it can be torn down in an effort to discredit your argument, even though it's not your argument. And GeoAngle made an interesting observation, and I'm just going to read you our comments back and forth. He said, Now I see why you were so upset with the straw man thing. The assumption that you were at least given a middle-class childhood, treated with not just common respect, but some kind of deference, just because you are white and male, is the worst kind of false projection. Straw man. And my response to George was, uh, thanks for that. This is something I never alluded to when arguing with Enigma Hood. This was over the um, Ferguson grand jury uh, verdict and also the Eric Garner case. So it was a race thing that we were discussing. But I was thinking. In some ways, I feel like I can empathize with minorities due to my own personal experience. It's not that I was discriminated against because of my skin color, but I was a minority singled out for arbitrary reasons and ridiculed, rejected, and excluded. I didn't even have the comfort of others of my kind to associate with. I was alone. In my school, I was the minority. I'm not playing victim or asking for sympathy. My life in the aggregate has been a good one, but I'm just a bit sensitive to people's assumptions about others based on arbitrary metrics, something social justice warriors seem to engage in, ironically while claiming to reject stereotyping. And I think this is an apt observation on George's part. Uh, I think that is the, actually the ultimate straw man, is to uh, assume characteristics about someone based on exterior observations of gender and race and that sort of thing, and project those onto that person without really knowing their experience as a means to exclude them from the conversation or to reduce them, minimize their opinion, etc., etc. And of course, I come from the, uh, from the position that the ideas are what's important. They need to stand on their own. The source, in some ways, doesn't really matter. And this is something that's done. I've seen it done in the Occupy Wall Street, you know, with the progressive stack that if you are uh, of some sort of a privileged background that you need to step up and step back. And step up, of course, meaning um, take a hit, you know, uh, be, be honorable here and step back. And, right? The progressive stack means if you're from privilege that you should close your mouths. And, of course, they've even actually expressed who should step up and step back. And those are guys like this guy, white males, because white male equals privilege. It equals a lot of other things, too which these are assumptions that you can't actually make. You don't know my life experience, uh, lived experience, and uh, it's interesting too because this is something that people who want to empower other people who may have been traditionally oppressed will empower them by saying, speak your truth. And 
What is your lived experience, right? But if you are someone with apparent privilege based on arbitrary external metrics that people can see, then you don't even get the opportunity to talk about your lived experience uh, in those kind of circles, right? In an open format like YouTube, of course, I can do it. But in many circles, I, I would probably be um, told to step up and step back. There are many other things that have happened to me in my life that I think sort of qualify my experience to be something different than what people would sort of project upon me as a standardized idea of the white male privilege. Uh, I've never aggressed sexually or physically against a woman or a man, actually. Um, but I have had a sexual assault perpetrated against me. And I had mentioned that to someone at one point in time. And um, we were talking about women who are sort of in fear of, or just even maybe not liking, in the Alexandra Blue, Clay, Blue uh, case, not liking the advances of certain men. And I don't know if she's ever been sexually assaulted or not. Um, but we were talking about women feeling sensitive to that. And of course, the narrative that I'm being given is that, uh, you know, the radical thing that you can do is believe a woman when she tells you that she's been assaulted. And this extends to, I've been told this as well, um, their feelings. So it doesn't matter if a man's intention was to be creepy, for instance, if she feels creeped out, then that's, that's the important thing. And to that end, I was in, engaging in discussions with different people, and I mentioned that I had been sexually assaulted. And I'll, I'll just dive into that real quick. I'm not going to get into details. Uh, I say sexually assaulted and not raped because it didn't, it wasn't invasive enough, I don't think, to be considered rape, and I am not interested in diluting real rape, uh, real rape victims who have a much more traumatic and probably invasive and threatening experience than what I have had. However, I can, um, I can appreciate when people say that sexual assault and rape are not about sex, that they're about power and control, because that's exactly what happened to me. I was about 14. I was attacked by a couple of girls that were roughly two years older than myself. At that age, they can be much larger and stronger than the male counterpart, of course, given puberty and, and how people develop. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very forceful situation. It was sexual in nature, and it was meant to be humiliating, and it was extremely humiliating, and I was powerless to do anything about it. They simply overpowered me. And so I can appreciate that. Um, and I mentioned that to this person and she said, well, it's still different for women. Uh, you are larger and much, lar much less likely to be intimidated. Now, intimidation, of course, is something where, uh, based on, you know, that's about, that's an internal thing, right? A person could be intimidating to a vast array of people and all of those people, probably to a man or woman, would react differently to that intimidation. Right? Intimidation is, is based on internal uh, calculations that people make, right? It's based on, so, you know, I've got some things that are not really in my favor when it comes to being intimidated. First of all, I was intimidated, uh, case, uh, well, grade 2 through 12, uh, pretty much. Uh, I entered adulthood as a fairly introverted person. I wasn't introverted with my family and friends, but I hated dealing with the public. I hated going to a bank and making a bank deposit. It felt extremely uncomfortable to me. I always felt like I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. I always felt like I was being disapproved of. Uh, add to that, of course, the, the sexual assault that I um, was victim of. Uh, also, as I mentioned, I've never aggressed against a woman, but I have had, had the accusations made against me that I had done so. This event never occurred. Luckily, it never made it beyond the threat uh, of that. I was able to convince this person not to go through with any formal charges, and, and it, took a lot of, it took a lot of reasoning with this person. The event never occurred. It was admitted to have never occurred, and it was admitted that this was a revenge play, that this person was just very, very angry and hurt by me. It was a breakup, and, um, and they were going to level this charge at me, which they knew was completely unfounded. And... Add to that, my wife and I were attacked while traveling abroad, and it was one of these things where uh, it was pretty violent and pretty and pretty brutal and out of nowhere. Um, it came from behind, and uh, they hit me. They came. It was one of these deals where I think they thought, take out the male because he's going to be there to defend, and then grab the purse of the female. She'll be easier to deal with. And so somebody came behind me, and they 
full force, I think, came at me with a board and smacked me in the face with the board. And I almost went out. I could feel my knees buckle and I was, <laughs> I went down. The stinging in my face, and I, I, and I, I remember not being able to see properly. Obviously, it probably actually still, you know, even hit my eyeball to some degree. Uh, the stinging was severe. In fact, I thought I'd been hit with a chemical. I thought it was a chemical burn. I was really worried for my long-term safety. You know, get hit by a board, you're going to recover from that probably. Some chemical burns can, you know, they can melt your skin and the whole works, right? I could lose the sight in the eye. I was terrified. I felt my knees buckle and um, there was something in me that just said, nope, you can't do that. And I swung around and I got a pretty loud voice when I want to, if I'm going to yell. And I just yelled, hey, and I went at those guys. They both at that point were on my wife and they were both grabbing at her purse. And uh, I was able to scare them off. Uh, my wife's no slouch either. I think she could have probably actually defended herself. She wasn't about to let the purse go. And they were smaller, actually, than both of us. And uh, yet, that colored our entire... That was day one. We had just landed, right? This you know, naive tourist deal. Uh, it colored our whole, our whole experience there. And it's colored a lot of our experience since then. We walk the dog every night. And there's quite often when a dark, shadowy figure is headed towards us or when people are walking behind us, uh, both of us are intimidated. Uh, both of us are in fear. I've never felt that fear to that degree in those situations before. Uh, my wife certainly, you know, she has to park her car a little far from work and she walks to work and she's aware of her surroundings. She's been carjacked as well, so that doesn't help. Uh, the long story short, of course, is that intimidation is not something that you can gauge externally how someone feels and how someone feels threatened is something that you can only engage by uh, engaging them and understanding what their lived experience is. And so the, the point of this video, of course, is not to uh, look for sympathy from anybody. I'm not interested in that. As I said in my comment to George, uh, my life in the aggregate has been a good one. A lot of the adversity that I faced when I was growing up, I wouldn't change even if I could. Eh, some things I'd change for sure. But I wouldn't change most of it if I could, because I, re I recognize that a lot of it has made me industrious. It's made me the person who I am today. I was able to come out of my shell in my late 20s, I suppose, and engage with people. I went from being the very quiet guy uh, in the shop to being the leader of the shop. I was a shop steward when the, when the company uh, ended up having a union come in, and uh, people even threw parties in my honor for stepping up for the rest of of the of the employees and that sort of thing and so you know in the aggregate I'm very very pleased with how my life has turned out to this point I run a successful business not looking for sympathy but to assume somehow <clears throat> that I that I don't understand the plight of someone else based on this arbitrary this external view that you see I think is uh, is short-sighted and I think it's an attempt quite often to to minimize and to uh, delegitimize people. And uh, I think that's really unfortunate. You know, it's interesting. I was engaging with Enigma Hood and we were talking about the struggle of minorities. And I've got this background where I feel, again, like uh, I had no, uh, I was being judged and I was being treated in a certain manner and I had no way, there was no way of climbing out of that hole uh, for me when I was a kid. Uh, and, and I had no allies. That's the thing. I really had no allies in that situation. And to imagine that I couldn't somehow understand the plight uh, of someone who's been discriminated against, I think misses the mark a little bit. I mean, it even goes as far as, um, and I'm not saying I understand the black experience. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. But to, to think that I can't somehow empathize because I'm a white male, uh, I think misses the mark. To the, to the extent that actually one of the main taunts that was leveled at me, ironically, was bush nigger. That's what I was called at school. Uh, I won't say, I was called something the bush nigger. I'm not going to say the first part because it actually uh, has part of my last name in there. But that's what I was called in school. Uh, that, that was a common taunt. And, you know, I just want to say to everyone out there, you cannot, it's ironic that, that you have to tell people who otherwise are into, interested in social justice, right? Interested in equality, interested in, in understanding people's lived experience and their feelings, that you should have to tell them that they can't judge a book by its cover. And not just to assume that you know something about someone based on physical and 
uh, life characteristics that you're, you're making the assumption of, and especially not to do it if you're doing it in an attempt to somehow discredit them or delegitimize what they might have to say, or to say, you don't get to have a voice in this discussion because you exhibit these particular characteristics. It's just wrong. Thanks to George, and thanks everyone for watching.